What's up, everybody? Happy Halloween. I've got my Beetlejuice shirt on. I hope everybody has some fun plans tonight with their families. Let me know in the comments what you or your kids or your grandkids are dressing up as. And we can look through those later and just remember the crazy trends of 2023. It's always fun to kind of go back, especially my college years, and look at what everybody was dressed up as, whether it was Heath Ledger's Joker um, or whatever the iconic figure was at the time. Beetlejuice is always going to be a classic costume that so many people dress up as. And today we have a little one-off video about more judicial conduct. Um, you guys enjoyed the last one we did of the text messages and the inappropriate behavior during trial. That was just so easy to condemn. It wasn't even funny. This time, we have a more salacious subject for sure. It is pretty wild, and we're going to get into what the details of that are. But does it connect with his ability to be a judge? Does it make him somebody that shouldn't be qualified to be a judge. And I think we're going to have some disagreement in the chat, which I always like. So give me your comments. Let me know what you think as we're listening, what you think the punishment for this judge should be. And I think it's important to point out that this is a magistrate judge who is not a lawyer, I believe. Um, but I think he's been a judge for like 20 years or something. Um, and I, I, might, I might be wrong on that. Maybe not 20 years. I think he's been a judge for a number of years. It's not like he just became a judge, but he's not very old. I think he's in his 50s. Um, but we'll get some of the details about what he did, when he did them, and what the potential repercussions are because the they're discussing this in front of the Supreme Court of their state, which is Kansas, and the disciplinary committee was unanimous in disciplining him. But the Supreme Court had a lot of questions. And some of the background and some of the facts in this case are that he was sending uh, sects and nude photos. And he was on a swingers website that was kind of public, kind of social media, but kind of not, it was kind of private. And worst of all, he was discussing meeting up with some of these other people on this swingers website in his chambers. And that's a big connecting piece to me. Um, because what people do in their private lives, while we agree with them or disagree with them, whether we would do that ourselves or not do that ourselves, whether we would want that person to be our friend, our father, our teacher, our, you know, person in our life that is around our kids may be different than can they be a judge? So those are going to be some of the topics we discuss. We're going to get into the details, get into what both sides think. There's a lawyer representing the committee that wants to discipline him. There's a lawyer that represents him. Another interesting factor, um, talking about whether or not they even have jurisdiction to discipline him is the fact that he retired right before this meeting, um, or before this hearing, which is an interesting move by him because theoretically he could rerun for office and get voted in again. Very interesting things. But what I want to know from you is where you stand on should judges be disciplined for things that happen in their private life. What kind of a nexus or connection do we need to his job as a judge and the courtroom that he works in, in order to have that discipline and what kind of discipline is appropriate? So a lot of questions for you all today. We're going to listen to this together and I think you might go back and forth throughout it and, you know, think about this and think like, Oof, you might think that a couple of times or I wouldn't want that judge in front of my case, but where do you finally land is really the question here. And let's get into the hearing. So Todd Thompson, bottom left, represents the committee that wants to discipline him. Chris Joseph represents the judge, uh, the which is in the middle on the bottom row. And then the bottom right is Honorable Marty K. Clark, who is the judge in question. The justices, the seven above, are all the Supreme Court justices of Kansas. 2021 consists of one case. Appeal number 123911 in the matter of Marty K. Clark, Magistrate Judge, Original Action and Judicial Discipline. Your Honor, the examiner for the Commission on Judicial Conduct has reserved five minutes rebuttal time. We are ready to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Shima. Counsel, will you please state your appearances? May it please the court, I am Todd Thompson, appearing as examiner for the Commission on Judicial Conduct, present and ready for argument. May it please the court, Chris Joseph, appearing on behalf of Judge Marty Clark, uh, who's also present. Um, I'm present and ready for argument. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Thompson, you may begin your argument. Thank you. This proceeding arises from a recommendation for judicial discipline from the Commission on Judicial Conduct. The respondent in this matter is former Magistrate Judge Marty K. Clark from the 20th Judicial District. Judge Clark retired during his term of office after the initiation of this action. This case involves Judge Clark's participation in a website 
self-described as an online community for swingers and with regard to his related activities. Judge Clark posted nude and partially nude photographs of himself and others and gave access to others to view the photographs. Judge Clark maintained an account at this particular website on and off for multiple years. During the years of his subscription at the website, the judge paid the fees uh, required by the website for giving access to others uh, to the photos and information about the judge and his wife and for gaining access to photos and information about other subscribers to the website. So it is a website. One of the questions the judge is going to ask is, does that make it public or private? They're going to compare it with text messages and things like that. But he did disseminate this on a website and give other people access that he didn't necessarily know. It's very different than just sending it, I think, to your wife or to your friend or some of the things that they're going to talk about in this case. But do you guys think that that is public or private to post it on a website that it seems like you have to pay to use or have some subscription? It's not like it's Facebook. Um, but if you pay to connect with people and see their profile and see these, you know, inappropriate pictures, what's your feeling on that? The website is used by subscribers for the purpose of connecting with other couples, which the judge describes as a dating website for couples. Some subscribers make connections that lead to sexual encounters. The account that was maintained by Judge Clark and his wife listed a false zip code and altered names, which we argued at the hearing before the panel revealed his awareness of the impropriety of his conduct. Judge Clark met the complainant and the complainant's wife in the late spring of 2019. They met at a bar, conversed, and after that meeting, Judge Clark and the complainant's wife began commuting, communicating via text message and email. I will refer to the uh, complainant's wife as the judge's paramour from this point forward. The judge and his paramour discussed in very graphic terms their attraction to each other and the prospect of having sexual activities with each other. Their rather salacious texts included messages wherein Judge Clark and his paramour actually discussed the details of a wished for sexual encounter in the judge's chambers. Can I, can I ask you? And that's where it starts to connect to him being a judge, right? And and you can tell me if you think it would be different if he never mentioned chambers, never mentioned that he was a judge, never mentioned anything like that versus just private you know, messages or whatever it may be, or the fact that he brought in his chambers, does that make a difference? And as you'll see, in appellate situations like this where you're having oral argument, the judges just fire away questions. So when I was on the moot court team, um, or when we have an oral argument in front of an appellate panel, you just start talking. You never know what they're going to focus on. They will start firing questions and you've got to be ready to answer anything. It's kind of funny to see all of them in their robes, like in their houses, especially the ones that like aren't in an office. About one of those um, exhibits, and I won't get into the details of the of, of the dialogue that was that was occurring, but it was it's graphic as you described. One of the one of the questions I have is that it appears that it has a timestamp on the time in which the um, texting was taking place, and it says two sixteen p.m. and I assume that's in the afternoon. And then one of the text uh, responses referred to, I should not be wound, this wound up on a Tuesday. Can we infer from that 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 was occurring during work? Or what, what, what do we take from that? And if, if we can, does that make a difference? Uh, I don't know that it makes a difference, um, although it might make it worse. The, you can take- Does it make a difference to you guys? If he's on these websites and doing this stuff at work, I think it does make a difference to me. Because if it was late at night at his house by himself, like regardless of what you think about it or what I think about it, I think it's tough to discipline somebody um, for, you know, having vices that are not illegal, um, but maybe just immoral at their house, you know, at night, whatever him and his wife want to do, does that necessarily affect his ability to be a judge? But I think it might be different. The fact that he's doing it on a Tuesday at two nineteen PM when he either should be working or, you know, is getting paid taxpayer dollars, you know, that, that does make a difference to me, but let me know what you guys think. Were texts because there was evidence before the panel uh, of the timing of the text. The text occurred during the day. Uh, the judge denied that it ever interfered with his performing his duties, but without question, they were texting back and forth during the court's business days. Uh, going on, I would note that uh, during this discussion about having sex in his chambers, Judge Clark readily identified his chambers as being in Russell, Kansas. Photographs of Judge Clark, um, most of which had been stored on the subject website in the judge's profile, were admitted into evidence. Those photographs uh, have been sealed or were sealed by the panel. Counsel, and, 
Yes. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your time's running down. And um, I guess my question, I'm trying to think how to frame this appropriately. And I guess the question is, do you have any concern that this proceeding is treading inappropriately into the private life of the judge? I'm just trying to, are we, are the, is the recommendation of discipline and the violations entirely founded on the moral disapproval of this behavior? Or is there something else? I guess that. So basically, and it's an interesting thing, right? Because these judges are about to come down with discipline on another judge for his private actions, which could literally directly affect these judges. Because maybe some of these judges are swingers. It doesn't preclude you from being a judge if you're a swinger, at least right now. And this judge, Judge Stiegel, wrote in the opinion that while judges are, you know, held to a higher standard, they are not the pinnacle of moral perfection. They shouldn't have to be perfect. Um, what they do in their private lives can be a little bit different than what people may find moral, or there can be some differences in how judges act. All of that is something he writes in his opinion, basically disagreeing that they should discipline this guy or try to keep him out of office or things like that. It really seemed like he was on the side of protecting the private lives of judges. That's the right question to ask. Well, I, I would note for starters, uh, this court's opinion uh, released in February of this year, uh, indicating that Canon 1 Rule 1.2 demands that a judge act at all times, meaning 24, and I'm quoting the opinion now, meaning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in a manner that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the jury. Or of the so that's, that's a holding by this court, I believe, saying 24-7, 365, you should uh, act in a way that encourages public confidence. So the, this is where lawyers really like to pick apart words and words are important and definitions are important. What does that mean to instill confidence in the public of your impartiality and that you can do the job as the judge? Now, I think text messaging during a trial about defense lawyers, about witnesses, about um, law enforcement officers is totally inappropriate and everybody loses confidence in the judge we talked about before. But if a judge is cheating on his wife, does that make you think that you lose confidence in him as a judge? If he is sending these kinds of pictures or these messages or subscribing to these websites, where do we draw the line? And that's such a, an interesting and, and difficult line to draw. And it's interesting because people have said, you know, if you mark the arches of society, um, when immorality just becomes normal, uh, sometimes that affects how society looks and what becomes legal and what becomes illegal and what we punish and what we don't punish. And if the judges who are running the courtroom are getting into gray areas or even areas that people think are red, how do we deal with that as a society? And I really want to know your comments and what you think, because it's a really interesting discussion. Judiciary. And, and does that, uh, so what is the standard that we apply to entirely private behavior? I, well, I just, I'm trying to figure out if this case has any kind of objective standard, or if this is just all of this, pri all of these private details, which are unpleasant, I'll say, have come to light and it embarrasses the judicial branch. And that's the grounds on which we're going to find a violation. Well, I would argue that these details are not private. That's why uh, these photographs were at a public hearing. That hearing was public. The decision was made not to, uh, or to seal them so that they wouldn't be circulated in the public, but a complaint came in from a member of the public. So it's not private. Second, the judge is subjecting- and I do think that that matters, that somebody, a, somebody, some citizen in the public filed this complaint based on these actions. So at least some people find this to be a problem for judicial action. Um, and that's important. It wasn't just somebody found out or some other judge saw it, but it's actually a member of the public that made these complaints whose wife was the one engaging in these conversations with the judge, which is interesting as well. And again- Problematic. I don't know how we deal with it, but definitely problematic. This is not great. This is not I idealistically how you want a judge to act. And it shows in my, I'll save some of my thoughts. I'll throw them out there now. Why not? One of the problems I have with this is I do think judges need to have wisdom. And to me, this shows a lack of wisdom and a, a lack of good decision-making to put yourself out there like this and even open yourself up to this. Now, if you do this privately and you meet, you swing or whatever, or you have an open relationship with your wife, not how I would do it, not what I think is right. But does that mean that he can't be a judge? Probably, maybe not, probably not. But sending this stuff out there 
kind of semi-publicly with these websites, people you have no clue who they are having access to this, being able to blackmail you or come into your courtroom and you may be affecting their life and they try to use this against you to make them give a decision that's good for you. That's not something we want. And to me, that's very different than sending a private text message to somebody you know, or even your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever it may be, um, which they they do start discussing. But to me, a lack of wisdom is something that should be problematic for judges in our society. And I hope that doesn't make me too legalistic or judgmental to say judges need to be wise because I do think that's important for judges to make good decisions, be good decision makers. Uh, himself when he engages in this type of conduct to the possibility of being intimidated or blackmailed by people who have these photographs. In this particular instance, the complainant opted- to How far follow- does this, how far does this extend? And let's just, and again, it's unpleasant to talk about this, of course, but let's assume that a judge um, is having an affair, an old fashioned affair, if I can call it that. Um, is that enough by itself I, I, to, to I, find a violation? And just, I, just right off that, how many judges do you think are having an affair? I mean, probably the same exact percentage as the rest of society, which is a lot. So I, I definitely don't think just having an affair disqualifies you to be a judge, even though everybody should think that was wrong for, you know, breaking uh, uh, what you have with your significant other. But I don't think that would disqualify you to be a judge. I think um, you probably need a little more detail, meat on the bones. But yes, I think it's quite why? why? Why do you need more? Isn't that judge also subjecting him or herself to public embarrassment, blackmail, all those other kinds of things? So yes. under the logic of- Yes, right but case, not just that in this case. There's a lot more in this case. It's been prosecuted. I'm finding a hard time distinguishing that hypothetical. Well, I, I don't think you need to distinguish that hypothetical. And, and I there is case law cited in the record that says, for example, uh, adultery in Connecticut, there's a Connecticut case cited. Adultery is not a criminal act in any way, but the court has held it still can create a situation where the judge is vulnerable and it can uh, create a blemish on the judiciary. So you're, and again, I appreciate the straightforward answer and I'm just exploring where these lines are, but it sounds as though the position you've taken is that judges are held to, uh, I, I suppose the right way to say it is, is the standard, the broadly acceptable standard of private behavior, especially with respect to their sexual lives. Is that a fair way to say that? I don't know that I'd say, especially with respect to their sexual life. I just think if you accept wearing the robe, you accept restrictions on how you can behave and that you have to- We we would all agree with that. We are, what we're trying to discern is what those restrictions precisely are. Well, again, it has to promote public confidence. Does this kind of behavior promote public confidence? Absolutely not. Does an affair, and as you call it, old tiny affair or old fashioned affair promote public confidence? Absolutely not. Does it endanger the independence of the judiciary? It absolutely does. And I see my time is up. It's actually kind of a good point, right? You don't want to open people up to blackmail or public embarrassment to where, I mean, we've seen what people are willing to do. I mean, we're watching this um, Charlie Adelson trial, and we're seeing what Catherine McBonawa is willing to do to protect her own hide. So our judge is above that. I kind of, I, I, I find myself as I've watched this now for the second time, flip-flopping on this as to where we draw the lines, because I don't want a judge that could be compromised, whether it's money, whether it's uh, blackmail, whether it's, you know, their family, whatever it may be, there's always going to be somebody, you know, that could kidnap a child and blackmail. I mean, that that's different than you putting yourself out there and opening yourself up to that. So that, that is an interesting thought. Are there other questions? Counsel, it used to be that uh, drinking liquor in public was forbidden. It was very dimly viewed by the public. How do we ascertain those societal mores other than simply to look within ourselves? Well, I think you have to look into yourselves and society. You need to get out more. Um, but I mean, we, we all have they're slightly different. I'm not saying that there's a red line that is the same for everybody, but but we all have standards that we think are appropriate or inappropriate behavior. And um, the good news is in this particular case, we're not even close to the line. We're so far beyond the line that uh, the panel voted unanimously. Um, it, it wasn't like it was vague or uncertain here. So- and that I think is an interesting point, right? So They're using this case, which is not abnormal. By the way, I think this was like two years ago. Um, But they're using this case to try to determine a lot of other things in the precedent and the ripple effect that's going to come from this case. And Todd Thompson's trying to be like, listen, this case is not close. There's 
all this stuff going on in this case. You guys are trying to like find different things that would make this case less abhorrent or less necessary for some kind of sanction. And what he's looking for is just a public reprimand basically versus just an admonishment. Um, but a public reprimand means a lot because if he ever were to run for judge again in the future, uh, that would make it a lot harder for him to win. But in my opinion, the judges are trying to see, which they should, what a decision in this case is going to have an effect on other things that happen in the future. So I don't want to get caught up in a academic discussion that is not necessary in this particular case. But the bottom line is... Uh, sorry, I just have to pause real quick. I just got the FJA membership directory and check out who's right there, front and center, your boy in the in the nice red pink sport coat <laughs> the conclusion of the panel is that <clears throat> the conduct in question violated the code because it was so far afield from the established line which is some moral compass and i think the questions that i've heard today i'm echoing perhaps but that moral compass is it are you suggesting it's just you know it when you see it or are there factors that can guide our discretion in identifying what that moral compass is. By the way, judges usually usually don't like the you know it when you see it, but it has been used in other cases, especially criminal speaking. I won't go into it because there's some sensitive cases that that's how they do it, but it is really interesting. Well, I, I don't think I use the term moral compass um, because I'm not sure this is just a matter of morals. I think it's something different than that. Again, I think the question is, does this kind of behavior promote the public's confidence in the judiciary or does it detract from that? My conclusion and the panel's conclusion, it very much detracts from that. That's not a moral decision. That's uh, an awareness of how the public reacts to this kind of behavior. Um, does it promote the independence and integrity of the judiciary? I mean, these are the terms from the code. Again, absolutely not. Uh, there's nothing about this. And if you don't really want morality and integrity to be something that we look at with judges, which I do, I'm fine with it. I like to have the best of the best making the most important decisions um, in our courtrooms. But then it shouldn't be in the code. We shouldn't say integrity and above reproach and things like that for judges. And, you know, morality has been used in um, rulings in the past on these types of situations. So if we are going to completely change that, then we need to change a lot of the jurisprudence on the issue. This behavior that makes you think this judge is above reproach or that this judge might not be uh, intimidated or blackmailed by someone who has possession of these photographs. So, that in turn impairs that judge's potential impartiality. So all of these dominoes fall over when this behavior occurs. And, and again, I don't think this is a just a mere, where are your morals? There, there are some standards set forth in the code. There are other questions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Joseph. Hey, please the court. Um, I, I believe I'm somewhat limited by the fact that Judge Clark decided not to file exceptions in this case uh, after he retired. I do, however, want to address uh, so just let me let, let me just address that. No exceptions were filed. So really what we are here on is the appropriate uh, discipline. Isn't that right, Mr. Joseph? Um, unfortunately, I think that's what Rule 620 limits me to. Well, no, it's not unfortunately. That's where we're at, isn't it? Well, to me, it's unfortunate because I think the court has a can of worms and potential to set some really bad well, precedent. But, but I, I want to understand the posture of the case is we're we're here on 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 what is the appropriate sanction in this matter. That's, that's correct. Right? Okay. Rule 620. Yeah, not whether or not he should be sanctioned because he did not object to that, I guess. But what is the appropriate sanction? Just an admonishment, maybe no sanction at all, or a public reprimand based on his actions, but he's already retired. Um, so a lot of different procedural things going on here. But Chris Joseph's very first statement out of his mouth basically was, I'm worried about the precedent that this decision could set. And he, in an appellate situations, when you hear judges firing questions at something, if it's good for you and it's a point that's good for you, you want to focus on that in your argument. So if all these judges are worried about how far this is going to draw the line for any judge in their private life, that's what you want to focus on because that's what's best for you. And it seems like the judges are on your side there. Lady limits me to tossing, talking about, uh, I can make a statement with respect to the disposition of the case only. Uh, I do think, Justice, and I was going to address your question, but it would be appropriate for me to uh, answer your question. That's fine. I, 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 you know, in, in preparing for this, I saw that and I just, and the, my, question was seeing the time and the day in question seemed to imply that this was during possibly, or I, th I think the assumption I had was this was during work hours. Right. And, and that would provide the connection that you see in the other cases where there's discipline, some connection to workplace conduct. Uh, I just want to point out that is in the record that was addressed at panel hearing. Uh, it was not a day when Judge Clark was working. He was not in the office. Um, it certainly wasn't established by clear and convincing evidence that he was. So I, I think that what you were
And now he's, he is quibbling with some of the facts that it wasn't during work. He wasn't in the office. Searching for perhaps was the hook between pure morality standard and, and some connection to his office. And, and the only I, I wasn't necessarily searching. It just stood out to me. Okay. Thank you. Understood, understood. So, so because of rule 620, uh, I am limited as you mentioned, just talking about this position. And the, the only, um, the only comments I have is I mean, he, has, he hasn't since retired. Um, so removal and suspension become irrelevant. The panel recommended uh, public censure. Um, you know, the you, court, Mr. Joseph, yes. do you have a position on whether or not this court has jurisdiction to impose any discipline, including censure, on a person who is no longer a judge? Um, it's a good question. Um, being limited by 620, I, I didn't plan on researching or arguing. Well, I, to me, that's the within the. To me, that's entirely within the ambit of of discipline, yeah. um, and I think it's an important question whether or not someone who's no longer a judge, because the code, by its terms at least, only applies to judges. It doesn't apply to retirement. Right. Um, and, and particularly, Judge Clark is uh, not an attorney as well. He's a lay judge. So um, he is done. He's not going to practice. He can't. Some judges, there's a concern. Uh, if they leave the bench, then become a practicing lawyer. Um, and that is a hook, if you will, to keep jurisdiction over him. That would not be present in this case. Judge Clark is retired and uh, not returning to the practice of law because he's not a licensed lawyer. Um, I think the court can do whatever it wants to do. But he could run for judge again. And again, this, this discussion is going to be, be delved into now about their jurisdiction, whether or not they can even reprimand him, what they can do, what they can't do. Uh, under the, both under the rule, uh, you can find no violation and dismiss it. You can uh, do any, impose any of the discipline options, or you can find there's no jurisdiction because he has since retired and uh, is no longer, I mean, there, there's no possible future conduct. So yes, I, I agree that that is an issue. Um, one, which I didn't brief again, because we didn't file anything. We didn't have any exceptions to make. Uh, my, my only suggestion in terms of disposition, if the court does accept the panel's uh, recommendation for public censure, uh, I would encourage the court to craft this in a way that does not set precedent that becomes an unfortunate precedent for future issues that might come before the panel uh, on questions of morality. Um, I think Judge Justice Wilson pointed out correctly that um, drinking was a moral objection. Um, homosexuality was a moral objection, both of which you could write language uh, following this panel's uh, rulings that could create something that's troubling for future generations based on what I see to be a reasonable person standard the panel suggests for determining morality. So whatever you do, my only suggestion, if you take the public censure route uh, to craft this in a narrow way that does not create problems for things that may seem problematic to a reasonable person in 2020. And I agree with him there. If they do do a public censure, which I think is what they ended up doing at the end of the day, um, even though some judges maybe disagreed with that, make sure you craft it in a way that's specific to this case that can't be overbroad and used against judges in the future about things that don't necessarily fit into what they're trying to keep judges from doing so that people don't lose confidence in the bench. Anyone, um, such as drinking or homosexuality used to be a problem morality wise, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I don't want the court to create something that's a problem for us. Uh, the generation appearing, uh, my kids appearing before uh, the court in 2015. Counsel, but isn't, go ahead, Justice Wilson. Uh, counsel, but isn't it appropriate for the court to look at what the societal mores and expectations and accoutrements are at this time, as opposed to what they were 50 years ago? So the, the issue to me is when is when is discipline appropriate? And I presented my arguments to the panel and they disagreed, but my, my response to you would be the same as was the panel, which is you don't, no, I don't, I don't think you look at morality as a basis, especially some of these private sexual morality as a basis for discipline, unless like these other cases and why I referenced Judge, Justice Rosen's question, unless there is a connection to the job. Um, and you'll see all the cases cited uh, in the briefing, you know, there's always some kind of hook to that, you know, such as pornography while at work such as um, saying something to a clerk or showing up a picture to a clerk who works for the court. There, you know, things that aren't present in this case because that Tuesday was not a work day. I think, counsel, mores are different from morality. I think mores is, is a broader concept of just general expectations of, of what's, how society expects people to act and, and whether or not there's some objective uh, line or... It is kind of problematic where we keep lowering the bar of people in leadership and people making decisions. I don't think we should lower that bar. I think we should probably raise that bar. Um, if these are going to be the leaders in society, if you're going to put on the robe, maybe you do accept some limitations and things that you can't do that if you're not a judge, then you could do. I don't think there's, I don't personally have a problem with that. You guys let me know if you do. Um, because with great power comes great responsibility, right? What's that from Spider-Man or something? Uh, that that's true. And I want these judges to be not people also maybe committing crimes or walking in the gray area or doing things that could be used against them. I really don't. And I don't really feel bad about saying that. Some clue that we can use. It, it, it's dangerous to try to do that. I'm, I'm not, my position is the court shouldn't venture into that realm. Um, it's dangerous to do, uh, you know, again, 50 years ago, homosexuality would have offended um, most folks in society and, and it, it shouldn't. Uh, it should not be a basis. It is a private life with no hook 
to his role as a judge. Um, again, I don't want to try to tread upon Rule 620 and try to backdoor in arguments because we did accept. Uh, we did not file exceptions. Uh, but I do think it's a slippery slope. So to the extent that you do craft public censure, I, I do worry about setting precedent that becomes a problem, uh, that this reasonable person standard is awfully difficult to apply. And what, who is the reasonable person? Is the reasonable person a member of a small religious community in Southwest Kansas? Is it the broad state of Kansas? Who is this reasonable person that sets these mores or morality standards? And I don't know that you can do that. It does become a slippery, slippery slope issue. I appreciate that you're trying hard not to tread beyond where you should go, but our, maybe our questions are pushing you that way. And since there's time on the clock, uh, sure. the question occurs to me, it's a policy question really, when we ask these questions of mores or morality, does it make a difference that this judicial position is a publicly elected one? They're also saying something like, I realize you maybe accepted that he did something that was in violation, but we still want to discuss it as a panel. So that's why we're asking, kind of giving you the opportunity to argue things that maybe, maybe you shouldn't be arguing because you already accepted. Well, you'll see in the, the case law, um, there, there are many of the cases that were cited and discussed in our briefing where, uh, for example, Pennsylvania and some other courts who have considered affairs and morality. Uh, suggested that there should be a line that doesn't go to this particular um, question. We just it just shouldn't be part of discipline because these are better resolved at the ballot box. For example, uh, if right, the idea is if, if his constituents don't like it, they can vote him out. Correct, right. And, and several courts have taken that position. It seems informed. I like that position. Uh, the other position that I like quite a bit is that uh, without some kind of hook that ties the conduct into the judiciary, uh, you, you shouldn't be going there at all. In this case, you had a complaint by a, a resident of Missouri. Um, you know, it, it's it's not there's no conduct that involved work because of that. If that Tuesday at two sixteen. If um, Mr. Thompson had established by clear and convincing evidence that Judge Clark was working that day, you'd have that. Um, you'd, you'd have something there. But uh, he wasn't there. It was a private personal phone. Uh, he was out of the office. There really is no connection other than um, the, the woman with whom he did not actually have an affair, uh, suggesting something would be some fantasy of being in chambers at one point, again, on his private personal phone text message. So there, there's no hook that ties it into his role as a judge. Um, and, and, and frankly, I, I, yeah, when you're looking at strictly questions of morality, those he wasn't a judge, you couldn't be talking about chambers. So I think there's at least something that wasn't, it wasn't the same thing as making a decision or being in the middle of a trial, like we saw in the last video can be resolved at the, board, at the ballot box or, you know, um, otherwise, if he is out of sync with the standards of his community. Counsel, um, in, in Ray Romy, the judge made fun of a prostitute during sentencing by getting her sentencing in verse. And in that case, it was found that that behavior was so egregious that he was removed from office. Later on, he was elected by the voters to that very office. So I would argue that both the court and the voters exercised their discretion in attempting to do their job as they saw fit. Um, can you distinguish that case from this situation? Yeah, absolutely, because what you've described again is conduct related to his performance of his job. Um, you know, if, if Judge Clark had made inappropriate comments, not even just in chambers, but at the courthouse, there, there's something tying it into the job. Here it is completely private, um, personal, out-of-court behavior. There's nothing tying it into his role as a judge. Uh, he didn't even do it in during the work hours. This is this is regulating the bedroom, essentially. I have a question. You know, let's take morality out of it, okay? Let's not even talk about morals. Let's talk about that the complainant in this case opted to file a complaint instead of posting this picture that he had in his possession of the judge needed for body parts. And instead posted that on his Instagram account and it went viral. Does that affect, um, as the code says, public confidence in the judiciary or promoting integrity? Um, that, that really gets into the blackmail issue, if you will. I mean, it, it, as no, well I'm as not talking about blackmail, I'm talking about the reflection on the judiciary. And you could say also, if I uh, post a Twitter, uh, a tweet that says F the president. Sure. In my own time, on my own phone, on my own private Twitter account. Does that reflect well on the judiciary? Does that promote integrity and public confidence in the judiciary? No, I, I agree that's a bad set of facts and don't want that. Likewise, if What's interesting about this whole discussion is basically every judge I know knows that they can't do stuff like that. So we're trying to like change that, it seems like, but every judge I know, especially the good ones, know you they just can't do stuff like that. I could if I wanted to. They couldn't. And if you ran for judge or if you look at the Supreme Court, um, questioning by Congress when they're trying to become Supreme Court justices, they dig into everything and use it against them and try to find things to make them look bad. So why give them more fodder? Act into your phone and took one of your private pictures off, which unfortunately can happen. Then post that. What happened here? What happened here? Was intentional putting out there sure. for public dissemination. No, no, it was it was as if I sent a naked picture of my wife. Um, it well, was, is it um, foreseeable? Well, no. Wouldn't it, it be is. possible? Definitely not the same. I mean, they keep making that 
connection, like sending a text to your wife or a sex to your wife. It's like, that's not the same thing. Cause you know, your wife, you trust your wife. If she betrays your trust, I think everybody could have the understanding that this judge didn't do anything wrong. He trusted his wife, his wife betrayed their trust or girlfriend or whatever. Very different going on these websites and posting it to people that you don't even know. And people, you know, I mean, don't we do that all the time on social media? Realize that if you post something, it's out there. But this was not on social media. This was a, a but only if you, post, one per- you know, the old adage of don't don't write anything down that you wouldn't want on the front page of the Wichita Eagle. I, I agree. It is it is risky in a sense, but it's also likewise risky if you send a naked picture to your wife. Uh, the same risk attaches. I mean, right. This this very well could have. I mean, whether or not it is. I mean, it's what essentially what you tell your kids. Don't take naked pictures of yourself. Don't do these things because it, don't write an email. No, I, I agree with that. Um, it, it's, not, it's not wise because there can be issues. That said, um, where, where does the court come in? It, it wasn't posted anywhere. The only reason this became a matter of public knowledge is because uh, it went to hearing and here we are. Somebody Otherwise, it wouldn't a member of the public complained about it. Um, yeah, to Mr. Thompson who put the pictures in the record. Yeah, otherwise nobody would have heard about it. Well, wait a minute, counsel. That's, that's not the finding of the panel. At the top of page 12 of the final hearing report, it says, you know, the respondent's decision to take a picture of his penis and post that picture on a social media website crossed that bright line and violated the judicial canons requiring a judge to act with integrity. And earlier in the decision, the panel specifically rejected your argument that this was not public. And so this case has got to boil down based on the findings to being the posting of these private pictures on social media that was widely, more widely available than just your sending a picture to your wife. And that's, that's why I think so much of this discussion is off base. I push back on that, Justice. I don't okay, think okay. those aren't the facts. I mean, literally, it, it is a, a website, but the only people that had access to this was the respondent and his wife. I mean, so it, it, it literally, you have to grant access. These are the facts in the record. Um, the panel characterized, and I see the language you're talking about it, I mean, they're calling it a social... Um, it is you know, kind of a gray area on the public and private argument. What do you guys think? Would you consider it public or private? It seems like you only you can only grant access to certain people, and that's kind of like a text message, but you don't know these people and you meet them on a website probably closer to private than public, but I don't know. It's definitely not the same thing as texting your wife. The only people, if you go to the record and the facts, the only people that have access to this to respond to his wife. Nobody else can have access to this. And those to whom they gave consent to have it released to you, is that correct? The respondent and wife, yes. The respondent and his wife, or not the respondent, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the complainant and his wife. So again, not talking about the judge and his wife, talking about the people that they connected with uh, the woman he was doing these, having these conversations with about coming back to, to chambers and whatever and swinging and her husband. So these are people he doesn't know now have access to those pictures and now they can share them, which is the same thing as texting somebody. Once you text it to them, they can then share it. We're given access by the respondent. To his wife. So judge Clark gave authority to the complainant's wife and the complainant to access the photograph. So this is two couples that had access to it. And, and this so, is, so at the top of page 11, the panel specifically says the respondent cannot hide behind a claim that these were not public because he was the only person who could give permission. Uh, you know, the, the respondent opened the door by releasing the photos to even one person on social media. Those photos could be generally disseminated to social media world and even finding their way to the commission. So I, 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 again, I, I think really both sides keep wanting to t- keep talking about moral compasses and moral codes. This case has got to boil down to the fact of using social media for this function. Those aren't the facts, Justice. I mean, it's the same. I think I read the language that they're using in there to mean, I mean, they, they didn't change the facts. Those are the facts. What, what I read that paragraph saying is the same as I'm creating the ability to, if I send a naked picture of my wife and she gets mad at me and files for divorce, and, you know, that's the, the revenge porn legislation that's out there, she could then post it on Twitter. She, I mean, you're creating this Mr. same Joseph, scenario. Um, Justice Biles drew our attention to the exact language in the uh, from the panel that I have at least conceptual concern with, the language about you respondent can't hide behind the notion that this wasn't public. I, I'm wondering if that's even right as a matter of law, because that standard suggests that there's no such thing as privacy at all in any two-way communication. So every email I've ever sent, every text message I've ever sent is now public. I don't know how we escape that conclusion from the panel's from the panel's conclusion. Usually the way judges would make this decision in like a trial would be to hire some expert that knows about this swinger site to see, is it really private or public? Is it constantly on this site? Can other people access it? Or is it really just like a text message or like an email? And it can only be released if somebody steals it or some of, or one of the people in the two-way communication then shares it. Um, so they're basically just like debating things that I don't think they, any of us really know the answer to at this point. I mean, I've never been on this website, so I don't know, but definitely by definition, private communications are private communication. So this judge has a point, like, does that mean nothing is a private communication anymore because anything could possibly be stolen or hacked into and then leaked? 
And that would be very troubling to me. I think you can use the same language. And this is what I said to the panel again, they didn't agree with me, so I acknowledge that. Um, you can use the same language and same description if I send a naked picture of myself to my wife by text and she later posts it. Well, it might help to take naked it. pictures out of the, uh, what if I just say, I'll meet you for lunch at, t at 12 p.m. at the Classic Bean or wherever, downtown Topeka. And I send that to whomever in a private text or email. According to the panel's findings, that email is public, right? W would you agree or disagree? No, I, I agree. No, I agree. Anything you send, there's a potential that it can be, I'm essentially saying the potential that it is later disseminated exists. You put it in writing, you send it to someone, therefore it could be disseminated on a public forum later. That, that Everything's that way, whether or not it's a naked picture or I'll meet you for lunch. It is a communication while private between two people. It could be later revealed to the public at large. You cannot hide behind that, if you will, is that the conclusion of the panel. Mr. Joseph, I assume from your argument that your recommendation to the court would be to impose no discipline? Yes, um, yes, it would be. Just to make that clear. Are there yes. other questions? Mr. Thompson, you reserve five minutes. Thank you. There's been a discussion about bad precedent or precedent that would cause a problem in the future. If you rule that this behavior does not require discipline, that's bad precedent. That will cause problems in the future. Justice Stiegel, I would respond to your suggestion that your hypothetical suggestion that this is very different. The whole purpose of this particular website is to send your photos, these nude photos, out to other people who you don't really know. So this is not the same as sending a message to your wife saying, let's have lunch at the Classic Bean. This is do, completely different. Do we have to, and I appreciate that difference, and, and that's a, um, a point worth exploring because I think this, where we draw the line between public and private is, is at least from my perspective, one of the most important things about this particular case, because it has such wide ranging implications for society and, and certainly for members of the judiciary. Um, and so my question is, it, it, you're essentially suggesting that there should be some kind of a foreseeability uh, um, element to this. Like if I make a private communication, you have to sort of assess the risk level of exposure. Is, that's kind of what you're saying, right? Well, I, I still would refer to, uh, I think one of the other courts talked about the fact that all of these other issues aside, when a judge is uh, grooming his private organs for purposes of taking a photograph and then takes those photographs and tries to claim that they just accidentally slipped off out of his phone um, when he was talking to a woman, that, that there's just no justification for that as being private. That, that goes beyond private. The whole point of taking those pictures is not for him to look at himself. He took those pictures to give to other people. And the same would sure, be true. But, but it seemed as though the panel drew such a wide net to what is public by any time anything is shared at all. And I certainly, you won't get any argument from me about the disturbing nature of the conduct here, but it, I, I'm having a hard time seeing how we draw the public-private distinction based on the content of the communication. It seems to me the content of the communication cannot play a role in deciding whether it's private. Or well, I, I would say the content can, because in this particular case, there are gross, vivid descriptions about having sex in chambers. Now, that is A, related to the judiciary directly and absolutely. That's not a private matter. So the content does relate to whether it's public or private. And I would encourage you, before this opinion gets written, to go back and read those text messages about sex in the chambers and ask yourself, is this a private matter? This is with a lay person in which he tells her where, from, from another state, which he tells her where his chambers are, and then they talk vividly about what would happen if they were together in chambers. So I also heard uh, a photograph as a phrase. There was not a photograph. There were a multitude of photographs, multiple photographs. So this wasn't the case of sending a photograph out. There were multiple photographs of both men and women sent back and forth uh, by this judge to and from this judge. So I, I would suggest this. The panel has recommended public censure. That's the absolute minimum that is required here. I would also note that the respondent is in his early 50s. He has the ability to run for this position again, which would be unfathomable to me. I understand the Romy situation, but in this particular instance. So there is that possible situation where he does run again. So the public censure again could make a big difference. Um, I'm not sure just admonishment is appropriate. I would suggest that there be some uh, additional criteria applied that would preclude him from ever being a judge again, unless he has had a great deal of education about the role and about the integrity of the judiciary. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, your last remarks kind of, I think, tell me the answer to my question. But again, I'm, I'm focused at the top of page 12 of the final hearing report that talks about posting, and it just says a picture, uh, but I don't care about that, but post the social media website. If you take the social media website out of this case, 
do you still have an argument for public censure of this judge? Meaning, is this actually public? Is it like Facebook? Or if this is private emails or text messages he's sending with swingers, would the, and talking about, you know, doing things in his chambers, the chambers of secrets, which is what I uh, um, titled the video, uh, that is a very good question by this judge at the end. If this is not a social media website and these are just private emails, do you have the same position? Well, I would argue this is a social media website. It's not an unlimited one, but it is a social media website. Take it out of the picture. Okay. So that, if it's, that didn't happen. Well, he still distributed photographs to members of the public of himself, of his genitals, to people he didn't really know. Initially, he posted these pictures and gave this couple the right to access them after meeting them one time. So yes, it's still inappropriate behavior. Just taking pictures of your genitals and distributing them in any way to the public, in my opinion, does nothing to enhance the integrity of the judiciary. The to the public part of that. Words are important. To the public. I think that's where some of the judges have an issue. Are there other questions? I did just have a quick question that I remember as you were closing. But what is your position on the jurisdiction now that the judge has voluntarily retired? I think the jurisdiction question was answered in Henderson 2 very clearly by this court. Um, if I can grab that real quickly, I'll just, I'll quote you guys uh, in holding that the judge should not be able to escape by simply retiring. Um, the respondent, this is your quote in Henderson too. The respondent suggests this court lost jurisdiction over him as a result of his resignation from his judicial office. This argument is inconsistent with prior decisions of this court and with the policies that govern the discipline of judges. So, and then it goes on, you go on to cite other cases. We also argue, found- You clearly have jurisdiction. We also found that because Judge Henderson was no longer serving as a judge, we lost the capacity to sanction him. Well, no, you lost the capacity to remove him from office. Well, no to longer... suspend or to sanction him, uh, and we didn't do anything else. Yeah, there was no sanction imposed. Correct. Oops. Mr. Thompson, your proposed discipline raises a question of, uh, in my mind, of what authority there is that a Supreme Court has the ability to bar anyone from future office? I, I think it does raise that question. I don't believe that question has been answered, although the code specifically states that you may impose any other remedy that justice requires. Catch all. Are there other questions? All right. Thank you for your arguments today. So that's the end. So what do you guys think? What is the right decision? Public censure, private admonishment, um, do something to make sure he can never run for office again or just nothing because maybe this is just what he likes to do in his private life and it doesn't affect his ability to be a judge. I cannot wait to read the comments and see what you guys thought about this one. I think that a public censure is appropriate personally um, for this judge. Maybe not make sure he can never be a judge again because I believe in redemption, right? And I believe in, you know, getting the right, like he said, uh, going to judge school again and talking about being above reproach and not doing anything that opens yourself up unnecessarily to blackmail um, and just try to be wise and make wise decisions. Um, you can do what you want in your private life, but just don't open yourself up quite like this to these sites um, and don't talk about doing things in chambers and definitely don't bring anybody in chambers. Definitely don't do this while you're on the clock or even while it looks like you're on the clock. Um, so some things like that, I think definitely cross the line in my opinion, but I can't wait to hear what you all think. Thanks for joining me on this Halloween for a bit of a crazy video. Um, but that's all we got until next time. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of the lawyer. You know, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who might be interested here on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at lawyer, you know, but on Instagram, we are still at Dragos Law. So look us up on there and don't forget to listen to the lawyer, you know, podcast available on all major podcast platforms. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us lawyer, you know, at gmail.com. Of course, all of these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer, you know.